there, everybody. So uh, thank you for joining us today. So, you know, one key area that I think that we're all here about, that we're here about for DevNet, is that, as we know, the, the world is shifting and the industry is shifting. So as we're moving to a more software type of basis, as we're not going away from kind of stovepipe solutions to really more integrated solutions, it's all about the broader ecosystem. Uh, and, and that's really key. The whole reason that we created DevNet was so that we wanted to enable innovation by our partner ecosystem. And we wanted to put more focus on building APIs into our infrastructure so that it becomes actually a platform of innovation in which uh, you guys, you know, as our partners, have more control, have the ability to innovate, have the ability to be successful in your business models as you get more flexibility and more uh, kind of uh, ways to integrate more closely uh, with the infrastructure. So uh, what we've done here today is we've actually brought together some of our top DevNet partners here, and we wanted them to tell you about uh, themselves and about their companies, uh, talk to you a bit about what's it like to be an entrepreneur uh, in this world, and then also talk about how they've integrated in with DevNet to bring both advantage for them, and then, of course, that always helps out Cisco as well. So uh, we're, actu uh, we're actually just going to go down the line, uh, starting right off, and what we'll have is about five minutes each for them each to describe both an introduction about themselves as well as their companies. Great. Um, my name is uh, David Jodwin. I'm the CTO and co-founder for Cafe X Communications. We are a customer experience management solution company. We provide, we're actually one of the, uh, labeled one of the, uh, 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 founders of, not founders, but uh, early adopters of WebRTC. Um, so we provide a set of rich APIs that developers can use in order to provide omni-channel capabilities from within their applications on their websites, within their mobile applications. And then we provide a series of server-based solutions that provide an enterprise on-ramp that brings those communications into uh, your existing Cisco infrastructure. Uh, inter interoperating with the, you know, everything from telepresence rooms to contact center um, uh, to their, you know, traditional uh, video telephony devices. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shaheen Peruz. I'm the CTO for River Meadow. Uh, we're a software company that writes migration software that moves servers into and between clouds. Uh, we, uh, in regards to Cisco, we're part of the InterCloud Fabric uh, platform. We are the onboarding solution into InterCloud Fabric. And uh, we've effectively created a mechanism, a SaaS-based solution that is built in the cloud for the cloud that moves servers without requiring agent installs or software downloads and moves the servers live. So the servers are up and running and never impacted, no change control required. Um, we've done a lot of work integrating with the Cisco field teams and the uh, cloud service provider uh, uh, arms uh, or customers, if you will, of uh, the Cisco field. So uh, it's really a solution that enables the onboarding into clouds as well as the movement between clouds. Uh, it also is a solution for doing consolidations of any of the traditional things that people would do hardware refreshes for. Cloud is now a target and we enable all those e use cases within the ecosystem. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Kai Huey. I'm the uh, CTO of Bits2 Systems, responsible for uh, product engineering and R&D. Um, I'm actually not a co-founder. I was actually employee number 32. Uh, that's, that's about a year and a half ago. Now we're over 100, so it's been uh, growing very rapidly. Um, where Bits2's products are used is in the industrial internet of things. As you start to deploy uh, sensors, and I'm talking about millions of sensors, and uh, in the utility space that started with deploying smart meters, when you have millions of uh, devices out there, how do you operate that efficiently? How do you manage that scale of events coming back? So our, our software platform uh, aids the utility initially to operate that platform, to deal with the events, to do the analytics on top, to present the right information so they can operate uh, with a minimal number of staff. So we've, uh, one of the toughest industries to be in is actually in the utility space where it, sales cycles are typically 18 months to 24 months. Uh, but we've gotten great success there, so now we started branching out into oil and gas and into other verticals as we uh, 
understand that the same challenges that they're finding in utility space and the operations is similar that the other verticals. We, so we're now addressing those other verticals. And with uh, Cisco's help with investments, it's, it's uh, allowed us to accelerate our, our movement to other verticals. Great, thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is uh, Luan Dang. So I always loved Cisco, coming back to Cisco is like coming back home because I used to work at Cisco from 2000 to 2004. Um, but Funware, I'm one of the three co-founder at Funware and we started back in, uh, um, I guess, 2009, right? In 2009, so it's a little over six years old. We're about 230 employee. Right? And what we do with Cisco is we work closely with Cisco CMX, the wireless network. Right? And what we provide is a back-end for multi-screen as a service. <laughs> multi-screen as a service is now you start seeing, you know, there's the smartwatch, uh, your iPad, you know, your smartphone, kiosk. There's a lot of touchscreen kiosks now, and we also start working in in-car navigation as well. So anything with a screen is effectively what we now start working with them, either on iOS or on, on the Android operating system. And where we work closely with Cisco is in the wireless arena, where with the CMX to be able to start detecting you know, when the user are on-premise, when they're connected to the network, how to engage them uh, at airport, at hospital, Providing them with you know navigation direction, uh, that's the stuff that what we do at Funware. Great, excellent. So uh, as you see, we have a very uh, interesting set of uh, of panelists here and partners. You know, ranging from collaboration, the cloud, the IoT, the mobility. Um, so I hope that some of this represents your businesses as well. Um, I'm going to go through a few questions here, but then after that, we're going to switch to questions from you. So go ahead and think ahead about any questions that you may have for the panelists yourselves. Um, so first we're going to start a little bit on the entrepreneurial side. So you know, I work at Cisco, big company, uh, some of you used to, <laughs> yep. but uh, now you're in a very uh, you know, enterprising uh, entrepreneurial si situations. So I guess the question that I have for you is why did you go out uh, to do your startup and then what advice do you have for other people who may be thinking about starting their own companies? Um, so, I'd like to ask a question. How many people here have started a company before? I mean, drained your bank accounts in order to survive for the nine months that you need? All right, how many people want to? Okay, all right, that's good. All right, so, uh, this, is my, this is my fifth startup I've ever worked, you know, I've, I've started other companies, this is my fifth one. Um, this is my third time partnering with Cisco. And I can and, uh, tell you. You still have a wedding ring on. And I still have a wedding ring on. So, so you yep, made it through. <laughs> made it through. Um, the being an entrepreneur is actually a balance between having conviction and being able to listen to the market. And what DevNet and Cisco give you the ability to do is really understand the market. They aggregate the needs of the marketplace so easily because of the number of people and the reach and the touch points that they have. That, but 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 don't trade your 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 willingness to listen to the marketplace for your conviction. You got to have a conviction and a belief about what problems you're trying to solve. Um, but you do need to be able to adjust. And I'll give you an example. When we started this startup, Cafe X Communications, uh, first year and a half, and I've got my deputy CTO here, Kevin, and so, so he should be up here, not me. But the uh, we tried three times partnering with Cisco. And we got told no every time because our products were either too competitive, they didn't fill a need, it was actually, it would confuse the customers. Uh, in some cases, it, there wasn't enough connection or tightness with the Cisco products. And they opened the doors and they let us talk to their customers. It wasn't them just trying to dictate to us. A lot of people are afraid to talk to Cisco. They think, well, if I tell Cisco what I'm trying to do, then you know, they're going to compete with me and build a product and then they won't need me anymore. You, you should belay those fears. That, that's not what Cisco's about. At least that's not what the new Cisco's about. The new Cisco is all about really embracing the developers and bringing them in and actually having them build solutions that work for their customers. They realize they can't do everything and they need us to help. Yep. So after that third pass, 
Kevin and I went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, this is what we've heard across the different business units at Cisco. And that's really what helped shape what we ended up developing for a product. And literally once we have, it was like night and day difference. Cisco took a strategic investment in our startup. They were part of our Series A round uh, out of Cisco Ventures. Um, we are actually just about to launch at this show here. Uh, Cisco is actually going to be OEMing our products. Uh, so that will be available to the entire uh, uh, channel partner community. And we are launching a DevNet portal in conjunction with DevNet to basically host all of our APIs as Cisco APIs. So it's just been phenomenal. And in the, that we started, we actually launched in fall of 2013. And we went from me, Kevin, and one other person to now we have over, just over 100 people in a very short period of time, uh, and primarily due to the help from Cisco. Great, fantastic. And thank you for, uh, for mentioning that, as I should say, you know, uh, to some of you it may be that DevNet just appeared, right, and all of a sudden there's a new part of Cisco Live, but there was a lot of internal work to get Cisco to understand and to really grasp and embrace the fact that we need the developer ecosystem and that the solutions are better when we allow our partners to innovate and we have better solutions for our end customers by working on this together. So uh, it is that commitment as opposed to being you know, scared, is this going to compete? As said, we think we can create much richer solutions together. So Ashan. Hi, uh, the, I would say that that was well said. There's uh, what's drawn me, this is uh, my second startup, uh, and what's drawn me to startups has been the ability to be agile and nimble and react to market changes that come. Um, I've also worked for very large companies and uh, have had the challenges with when you're trying to make a shift in the company, it takes years to decades to make that shift happen in a large company. Whereas uh, we're able to identify a particular challenge in the market, uh, be very nimble and agile about developing a solution for it and go. So that's what draws me uh, to the startup world. Um, it comes with its highs and lows. So any of you who haven't done it yet, there's, there's pluses and minuses. The highs are phenomenal, the lows are really low. Um, but it's, it balances out, it's all great. Uh, the, uh, in terms of what Cisco has done for us at River Meadow, um, they're also an investor in uh, two of our rounds, and uh, so a strategic investor for us as well. They uh, are a go-to-market uh, uh, primarily channel for us. We're, we only sell through OEMs, and what Cisco allows us to do is focus our energies on engineering, so we're primarily a software company, and we focus on developing our product and answering the needs of the customers and our partners' customers. And Cisco is one of our OEM partners, and we leverage the Cisco uh, go-to-market machine to enable us to get to market. So similarly, we're, there's uh, River Meadow SKUs. It's called Ramp within the uh, Cisco uh, vernacular. But um, there's SKUs to be able to acquire River Meadow migrations uh, as a Cisco partner. And that helps us tremendously because it could be attached to sales of UCS, it could be attached to customers uh, going into the CCS platform for cloud, it could be attached in services teams selling VMware, for example. It, it's really, from our perspective, um, uh, a huge enablement. Great. So, so my perspective is a little different because I wasn't one of the co-founders and I was actually, like I mentioned, an employee 32. What attracted me to Bitstu as a startup was, um, was two reasons. And, and that reason came true when I was asked why I left. And I said that I believed in the technology that the company had and I believed in the people that ran the company. Because I was risking 15 years in the utility, which is like a golden ha handcuff, because once you get there, you never leave. Um, but I left because of the two reasons. I believed in the company and the technology and was introduced to Cisco actually on the project where I was in the utility deploying a uh, Cisco IPv6 solution for the utility for smart meters. So that's a two million node IPv6 network. And uh, there was joint success there. Bitstu was there, but Cisco was there. And that's where the relationship really took off because there was uh, uh, understanding that there was a value proposition for both working with Cisco and that Cisco saw value in Bitstu. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. So for me, Fun Funware is now my fourth startup. Um, the first three has been successful, so I knock on wood that you know this one turned out all right. Um, and the first one actually started um, exactly 10 years from the date that I start Funware. So call it you know sort of superstition, but it's exactly 10 years before. Uh, and we end up selling the company to Cisco. 
So then that's how I kind of got involved with Cisco back in 2000, early 2000. Um, my, my advice to people, anyone who's interested in starting, for me personally, it's, it's, it's the excitement of going out on your own and actually venture to do it, right? Now, you, it's not for everybody. I think it's, you've got to have the stomach for it because, as they mentioned, the high is, could be very high and the low is very low. My wife has now got used to this roller coaster that I go through as being one of the founder of startup. Uh, so she's gotten used to that. Uh, so you kind of have to prepare yourself for that. And then the other piece is that I would recommend is, you know, I know a lot of people who try to, to start company while they're at their main job and they're trying to do it on the side. And my recommendation is don't do that. I mean, startup is hard enough as it is. Just either you do it or you don't do it. Don't do it halfway. Just go all out and go all in and you just do it. And that would be my advice. And then the other piece that some of the panelists already say is that don't worry about larger company taking your ideas of anything. If you can get a, comp a big company excited about your idea, that's a good thing, right? I mean, getting Cisco excited about idea was great for us in the first company. Even for this company with the investment, Cisco opened doors that like, I could never imagine as a small startup. Like we could never you know, be able to talk to Kaiser if it wasn't for Cisco to open that door for us to get into that hospital, right? So if you're gonna do a startup, just go all in, do it. Don't worry about large company competing with you. Just partner if you can and just, you know, they'll, they'll either assist you or, or they'll acquire you if you, you know, are, you know, inspired enough to go after what, whatever that you're doing. So that would be my recommendation. Great. Was there any more advice that uh, you had for any budding entrepreneurs out there? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, actually, there's, there's two things I wanted to mention. One is we keep talking about and revisiting the point about the Cisco machine. Yeah. Cisco is a machine. It is. Yeah. They, they, if you think about it from an ideologic, ideological standpoint, they are like an epistemic aristocracy, which means that, <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, they, they, know what's, they know what the process is that they're trying to dictate, so they're very process-oriented all the way through the chain. Now, when you're a startup, you're more like the soul of a new machine, where you are a team of people who are from the ground up trying to put your ideas together to solve a specific customer problem. When that team meets with the epistemic aristocracy, there is very often a clash you have to be careful of. That Cisco machine can very easily um, overwhelm you very quickly. And you've got to be very careful in working with Cisco so that you don't let that happen. You can't let them, they could very easily destroy your startup by the demands that they can place upon you. Right. But the, the, the thing is, if you make the investment and you work your way through it, when you get to the other side, your product will be 10 times better. Because that process is all about polishing and getting it ready so that it's turnkey in the marketplace, it can be supported without a lot of effort, that it's what the customers need, that there's not gonna be a lot of support demands placed upon you. And then at that point, now you're reaping the benefits of the sales machine. Yeah, I'm just gonna add one, one, one specific example, for instance, in the first company that I did, we were heavily based in the beginning on a, a protocol called MGCP, uh, or Megaco that came later in the voice over IP space. When we met with Cisco, Cisco introduced us or let us know that they are heavily behind SIP, which is a different protocol, a competing protocol, right? And, and when you start learning a company as big as Cisco are putting their weight behind a certain protocol, we actually shift our entire company in essence to align that up. And now you can see you know, the world unfold you know, 15 years later, practically nobody heard of the other protocol and SIP has been the main Protocol. So, and now it's going to be WebRTC. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one more piece of advice I'll give our uh, current CEO. He basic his comment about what is entrepreneurship is that is resilience, and uh, the key thing there is that you're going to run into a lot of walls, a lot of doors, and it's being able to turn around and go a different direction. 
there's, uh, there's no specific fork in the road that you're going to run into. You may run into a dead end and you got to turn around and go back and find a fork somewhere, but it's the resilience that's going to keep you going and make it through. Excellent. Um, so, so another question, and some of you have answered some of it through, so, uh, so it's all right if you've already feel you already answered it, is um, how is being part of the Cisco ecosystem and part of DevNet, how has this helped out your company? I mean, I, I can start. I mean, for, for us, uh, and I alluded to it already with, you know, Kaiser Opportunity, but there's, there's many more example of it, right? There's, um, to me, working with Cisco, while Cisco is a very large company and sometimes it could be challenging but if, to navigate, but once you kind of find the right person within Cisco or the specific group that you need to work with, like, so for us, you know, it was looking for the wireless, and once we zero in that, okay, it's just the wireless people that we need to work with, we know which building they're in, and, you know, we got, you know, Cisco badge, that part of the partner, that we can now just go there, and we, like, constantly know exactly, and once you work really closely with Cisco, one of the things that it started opening up for us is Cisco channel, it's like, he mentioned earlier, it is a machine. I mean, Cisco's got this machine that's cranking, and it's like quarter after quarter. I mean, it's 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 amazing, right? So you got to get yourself sort of plugged into that machine and figure out how to leverage that machine to your advantage. Because as a small startup, it's hard to get you know through some of these door on your own merit, even if you have great technology, right? Because one of the other piece that I mentioned, I should have mentioned the last question is, for a startup, technology is, while it's great, I really believe it's really about the people that you're going to have recruit initially and who you end up partnering with. Because while the technology might be great, you, might, you have to maneuver and change with the market and it requires the right kind of people to be able to make that change, right? Or to be, have the right partnership, and at least for us, with Cisco investment has opened up door and allow us to now go after airport, which would not have talked to a small company like us, you know, are, are now allowing us to talk to hospital. All these vertical that Cisco is already in with their wireless network allow us to kind of piggyback on those channel that they're already in to be able to get to those customers. So I can add a little bit to that, is that uh, you know, our software uh, runs on the IOX platform. So we can run in the data center and also uh, out in the fog. That's a huge differentiator for us. And that was only, a, uh, only made possible because Cisco opened up their hardware platform. Right? So, and I think Susie talked about software being the key here. So that opened up a whole opportunity for us because that really differentiated us as a company because everyone wants to do analytics and do it in the cloud or do it in the uh, data center. But now to be able to do that in the fog was a huge difference for us. So um, that gets us really excited but also gets Cisco really excited because it, it, there's a value proposition for both the hardware manufacturer and also the software player. So uh, we've definitely leveraged that because that's, that's a huge differentiator for us. So um, it takes time to engage the Cisco engine. It does. That's described here. You know, our Series A uh, closed at the end of 2013 and we're into 2015. Series B just closed. We're now starting to engage that huge Cisco engine and to the point where we can say that, yeah, our product will be OEM'd as part of that hardware platform. Right? So that's our end goal for this year. Uh, so there's a few companies up here that have gone a little further, but that's, that's a, a, a great go-to-market strategy in a platform area that didn't exist two years ago. Yeah. Right, so it's really been powerful for us. And, uh, and that's fantastic. So you know, in the case that Cisco's pretty good at making routers, right? and then the role that they play in IoT is to be a place that you can actually place applications for IoT apps at the fog layer uh, that Kai was just talking about. Uh, but we definitely want the ecosystem to be writing those apps, you know, the IoT apps that are sitting and distributed across that fog layer, so it's a perfect partnership there. Great. So uh, it's really the same as I said before. The key thing for us is the go-to-market, having the ability to leverage Cisco's reach from a, both the sales and partner and channel perspective. Uh, that's been phenomenal for us. Also access to the engineering teams in the cloud and uh, inter-cloud fabric teams has been phenomenal in terms of integrating our platform to work with those. So there's a mix of uh, getting close and tight access to the engineers as well as having a go-to-market machine that we could not afford on our own. 
Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to give is advice, and these are kind of like little secrets through our process. One is, <laughs> when you work with Cisco, you need a strong sponsor. Yeah. And that means you, 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 need to, you need to find that person. It's just as important for you to make sure you pick the right sponsor within Cisco. It, you know, the excitement is, is, oh my goodness, the director of product management for blah, blah, blah wants to be our executive champion within Cisco, and, and they could be the absolute wrong person to be championing you inside of Cisco. If you pick the right sponsor, you will very quickly get the attention of Cisco Ventures. And when you go to meet with Hilton Romansky, you want your sponsor to be saying the exact same thing you're saying. So, you know, that messaging needs to be consistent. You can't contradict your sponsor. So if your sponsor doesn't get it, educate them, work with them, or find a new one. They will, they're, look, you pick the right person in Cisco, they will introduce you up the chain to the right people to get you your attention. That's how we got our OEM relationship. We didn't start by asking for it. Cisco came to us and they asked us if they could work with us on it. And that came from us basically, actually, Two years ago, we did started out by we actually hosted jointly with uh, uh, DevNet a hackathon at Florida Institute of Technology, and we sponsored a hackathon with the APIs, and we had Cisco APIs and we had our APIs side by side. We had 80 teams competing for the prize money that we jointly put into the pool, and it, from there we just started ourselves. We got attention after attention after attention until we found our right executive sponsors within the BU. And then from there, they made all the right introductions. They knew what our value proposition was. Um, they believed in it. And that, that made all the difference in the world for us. And, uh, and for folks who think uh, it, it sounds hard to get in and get to that level, uh, but something like DevNet helps out because you can participate. The APIs are more accessible before you've made that connection with a person. You can participate in the hackathons. We have our hackathon, our, the applications that were made in the hackathon this past weekend were incredible. The best apps that we've ever had made in any of our hackathons before. Uh, so they're getting better and better. And those are things that we very much showcase. And our goal on DevNet is if you do a fantastic integration through DevNet, we want to feature you guys onto our webpage, onto our portal, and in our different events going forward. So just let us know when you've done an awesome development. And also give us feedback on the APIs as well. So I know they're not perfect, but give us feedback on that. Tell us how you're using it. And we actually want to feature your success stories, because that's really what DevNet's all about. Um, I have a few more questions here, but do we have any questions from the audience here? Do we have some more questions? OK. I'm going to keep going down my list then. Um, what kind of doors have opened for you since Cisco invested in your company? So I know that, uh, that Luan already mentioned the ability to get to Kaiser, for instance. Um, but does anyone else have uh, you know, specific instances there of some doors that have been opened? Definitely for us. Um, you know, we talk, I talked earlier about uh, starting out in the utility vertical. Uh, Cisco has been fantastic opening doors for us in oil and gas as an example because Cisco has uh, folks focus on all these different verticals and all we need to do is get one connected to us and then they have, they have SMEs in that, in that vertical that provide us insight, right? So it's like an, uh, it's like an organization that is ready and waiting for you to, to come there, right? So for us, easily to go from uh, uh, utilities where there are dedicated Cisco folks and then we're connected to the oil and gas, then it'll be to manufacturing. And so it's, it's been an easy road for us to, to move to verticals using the expertise that Cisco's already established because they're well established in, in all those other verticals. So that's been a great help for us. Excellent. For us, uh, it's been really access to some of the largest service providers in the world. Um, we've, uh, we've been selected as onboarding solution for uh, Verizon for T systems for so there's uh, those are companies that have come through the Cisco channel. Um, there's others, but uh, uh, all over the world, and we are based in San Jose. So it's uh, our ability to work with uh, service providers in Australia, and UK, and in India, in the U.S., and uh, have access to these resources and the sales force on the ground in the geographies to help us get those deals done. Okay. Um, so, uh, so next I'm going to say is just uh, as we get into the technology of your company, how does your uh, company's technology complement Cisco's technology? And maybe you can talk about which assets that you're using both on the Cisco side as well as on yours. Sure. So, um, so our technology 
Uh, how many people here are familiar with WebRTC? Do you know the term? Mm -hmm. Okay. So WebRTC is real-time communications, uh, a specification that allows browsers to act as a communications endpoint. And there is both a media channel and a data channel that goes with the specification. It's a very, very simple spec. Um, it was what SIP was originally meant to be, in my opinion, because SIP was originally meant to be very simple. And then, you know, after 4,000 RFCs get developed, SIP became very complicated, mm -hmm. and, but it eventually became the underlying communication platform for everything. Yep. But what it does is it makes rich communications accessible to any device, every device. But existing enterprise infrastructure is 90% SIP and it's 90% legacy infrastructure. And these organizations can't just rip and replace all that tech. So there is this artificial barrier between the capabilities of this new technology and the enterprise. And what we did was is we knew that Cisco, with that underlying infrastructure already existing in these enterprises, that if we built the right solution, we could provide an on-ramp for all of those, you know, hundreds of millions of consumers. I think it's gonna be, what, seven billion? of uh, uh, WebRTC endpoints by 2017, which will be, that's what people want to communicate with. It's your phones, it's your browser, it's your tablets, it's everything. Uh, it's even machine to machine. And from that standpoint, our on-ramp basically allows all of those devices to communicate effectively with the existing infrastructure. We went one step further to say that communications without context is irrelevant, and we built a context aggregation bus that we call Pallets that basically provides a an intelligent integration into Cisco's Unified Contact Center, right, UCCE, UCCX, as well as to the CUCM for routing and the ICM for routing. So from that standpoint, it, it really allows the intelligence of the Cisco routing infrastructure for contact centers and enterprise communications to allow those inbound communications to go to the right point. Excellent, great, thank you. So um, for us, it's really been the integration with ICF that is the tight integration. We've uh, created a platform for migration that goes beyond just simply replicating data from one server to another. We've, uh, we've created extensions, two in particular, called migration extensions and platform extensions that enable the end user to customize each migration or customize every migration and add additional functionality. So if you think about the migration ecosystem, there's discovery, there's the planning for where you're going to go, what you're going to move, then there's the movement, then there's testing, and then there's ongoing synchronization. We've solved the step in the middle and we've created these platform extensions for Cisco's discovery framework to be able to discover sources and it's tightly integrated in the platform. Then there's the advanced services team who go in and do the planning and prep. Then there's uh, automated testing that can happen through reporting and testing suites. And then finally, the continuous replication with a, uh, uh, I won't mention the name, but a data replication tool that Cisco uses uh, for doing continuous replication of the data for DR. So it's, it's really become a onboarding, um, T-Systems calls it migration as a service. It's an onboarding solution that's end-to-end -end and intended to be part of the Cisco ecosystem in terms of getting into UCS, inter interacting with Cisco clouds um, and uh, UCS-based platforms effectively. And from our perspective, we're agnostic of the uh, source environment, so servers can be physical, virtual, or in an existing cloud. And the target, we support just about every cloud target uh, out there, uh, with the exception of software and Citrix. Um, so it's really giving the, we give the, enab the enablement to move servers into and between clouds. Cisco gives the ecosystem that makes all the other parts that need to happen uh, come to life for migration. For us, it's really straightforward. Uh, Cisco provides the platform, we provide the software. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a great way to work for us. Um, the, the thing is that, and, and for us, is that initially it was for the connected grid router, the 1000 series, but they started to expand the uh, IOX footprint to other devices. So now they've just opened up an, an, a larger ecosystem for us because a lot of those devices are deployed to maybe specific verticals, like the ISR 800 series uh, routers are targeted for industrial settings in oil and gas. Well, all of a sudden, if our software uh, runs on IOX and IOX is available, then that's just another platform that we can target. 
Um, so it's been great for us because it's, it's part of the Cisco's broad IoT strategy is to enable fog computing. So this is a major driver for them and so we can benefit from that as they continue to ex expand out the platforms that support IOX. Great. Thank you. So for our tech and the integration with Cisco's tech, so as I mentioned earlier, right, for us, we built this thing called multi-screen as a service, right? We handle the back end for all the different multi-screen. Well, each and every one of you is carrying one of those multi-screen, and that's your smartphone, right? And maybe some of you are carrying two if you have like a smart watch device as well. But your phone, if you already connected to Cisco Live Network, the Cisco 2015, right? then your MAC address is now being exchanged with the Cisco backend uh, from the access point to the wireless controller to the MSC. So, and then the MSC forward that to us, so we now can like, in theory, could, could actually know your MAC address, but not know which one, it's just a generic aggregate of your MAC address. So that's how we integrate with Cisco, with the Cisco wireless. By doing that, we can then do detection that we know that you are on premise here. Right? So we know that you're here, we can send you an alert message, we can tell you things, and we know when you leave, like as soon as we detect that you're no longer on the network. So that's how we integrate with Cisco from the, the wireless infrastructure. So what Cisco has is, you know, they provide this connect, engage piece. We're sort of that engagement piece, right? We built the application on top of the wireless network to then be able to provide you with direction, with, you know, the right message depending context sensitive as to where you are, right? And Cisco wireless with all the access point, you know, do you see an access point right there? There's another access point there. With all these access points, Cisco are also now able to triangulate and know, you know, where you are based on sort of the, the, the signal of access from each access point. Well, where you are, that information, when we integrate with Cisco, allow us to then be able to draw on a map on your phone where you are if you have our application. So that's how our tech works closely with Cisco. Great. Uh, uh, so if I can ask you guys, how many of you are in collaboration, working in collaboration? And then how many of you are working in cloud? How many of you in, uh, in IoT? Okay, and then how many in like mobility or location-based services or wireless? Okay, uh, are you in networking? Okay, great. So, uh, so you see that these are a lot of the most strategic areas, and then these uh, integrations have been really important. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, obviously, uh, culture is one of the most important things to a startup. Uh, how has your culture and process been affected uh, by working with Cisco? And David, you don't need to answer. I, I know our so, the question yeah, so, the, so the question was, how does uh, culture... How, how does your culture, how's your culture, company oh, culture? Yeah. Culture is a very important part of how have you, startup. How, yeah, how, how has that been affected by Cisco? working with Cisco? Yep. So I'll take a first pass at it. Um, like I said, uh, Cisco's a big company, and it's it's they they set their and it's been said across the panel, they set their direction. They know what they're doing. They know what they want, and aligning with that um, until you get the right sponsor can be a challenge. So, from a cultural perspective, it's been great boons for us. But there's times where there's a direction that's set and then has to change after a significant amount of effort has gone into that direction. So I would say make sure you find your the proper executive sponsor and uh, and make sure that you're working towards something that is aligned with Cisco's mission as opposed to an individual who believes it's Cisco's mission. Um, we've had some of those challenges. Anybody else want to address the culture question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, s startup by, by nature, you know, is, um, you know, it's very flexible, right? I mean, that's one of the reason, you know, for, at least for me, at least, is why, you know, to go do a, a startup. So you can, you know, be flexible, be able to quickly move, be able to adapt. So when, when we start working with Cisco, it actually allow us to, you know, on the first company I already mentioned, we actually made almost like a 90 degree turn with the, the major underlying protocol of the entire system. So that was a big change. 
here it's, it's much less of a change, but we did shift resources or within our, our company to align more you know, resource with Cisco and the tighter integration with the Cisco wireless network. So that's some of the changes that we did. Uh, so, so for us, it's a, it's a little different, right? So, because we were um, about a size of about 30 when we started to engage Cisco. So we actually put a person in charge of, of out of our business development team for the Cisco relationship. He's sitting in the back there. Um, and that was important for us because it was a conduit both ways. So it, it prevented that, uh, that shotgun scatter approach where you could be driven crazy because there's five people trying to reach different parts of the organization and vice versa. So that really helped us uh, streamline and organize it and have a structured way to engage Cisco because um, he would know how to reach into the technical engineering organizations, into sales, into other areas, in marketing, where, where actually Cisco has been fantastic for us from the marketing perspective. Right? But now, as we got our Series B funding, what we've done is that we actually set up a tactical team of five people, uh, business develop, pro, uh, program manager, engineering, and, and to drive that relationship even further. So we have that as a strategic uh, initiative. Uh, so we, we're, we're structured that way. So that allows us to not get overwhelmed, but at the same time leverage Cisco to the maximum. Yeah, so that's so, the price when uh, your technology is so interesting. Cisco has a lot of employees. A lot of them will get interested in you and all start calling. <laughs> so it's, well, actually, even though Kevin said I don't need to answer this, I do want to actually bring up a point, though. Uh, we talked a lot so far about sponsors, finding the right sponsors within Cisco. Um, being malleable but still having the conviction of what you are and who you are. You have to have your own identity because that's part of what Cisco brands and markets is I'm bringing my partner in and my partner has their own identity. There are too many Cisco partners or you should say a lot of Cisco partners that lose their own identity. You can't do that. If you do that you will not stand out and then you just become part of like the waste of the machine. Um, I'll give an example, right? So how many people here know that there's actually at least five different sales organizations within Cisco, <laughs> distinct sales groups within Cisco. Do you know how to navigate them? Okay, so there's one sales organization called GET, which is uh, Global Accounts, and there's only 30 accounts within the GET system of the sales organization. And we work with the GET, you know, the GET accounts, and, and you know, that's one of the doors that really got open from Cisco. But it also requires partnering and sponsoring with the individuals within the people who actually work with the customers and understanding that they serve as a bridge for you. It's like I waved when I saw him show up. Ken, Ken, Ken McLeod, stand up, Ken. Come on, stand up. Where's Ken? So Ken, right? So Ken is a Ken Cisco, and he is responsible for the relationship at one of the largest banks in the world, uh, which we are. There is a, a customer of ours, and Ken actually serves as a coach a mentor and a bridge when we're dealing with that account. Use those people, they're there. They know those relationships, they have them, and they will help basically blend your culture into the customer's culture, and then they provide that, that uh, gravitas to that relationship that the customers then trust. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know how to leverage those types of relationships and make them work, they become an extension of your team. If you don't treat Cisco as an extension of your team, then they're never going to treat you as a true partner. Excellent, great. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, we are participating in Cisco incubation program for looking for OEM opportunity and I know there are many things to be completed before that, like finding good sponsor, finding possible customer, or integrating our software into Cisco platform, or getting strategic investment. But the problem is that they d depend on each other. So my question is, how to? What is the right order of doing such things, and how to? accelerate or make it faster, the process of collaborating with Cisco? Sure. I, I can take some first step and answer. So one of the first thing you need to do is work with, even if you haven't find the right sponsor, trying to figure out where your tech, like what you need is one customer. Like don't go after the big customer yet, just one that's easy to work with, but if you can work with one customer where your tech and Cisco tech can come together at that one customer, 
one win will then get a lot of people's attention, which then replicate to a bigger win. Then you start getting even bigger people's attention. But that first key customer that you can combine the tech, you go after that first before almost anything else because you need a, a, a win. Go after that win. So Cisco salespeople have a herding mentality. They will distrust any new tech yeah. until they see a success. Yeah. The minute they see a success and they see that other Cisco sales reps have made money doing it, then they will all follow each other. It's, it's, and that, that's the way it is. So don't try and get 27 salespeople to try and sell your stuff. You need to go talk to 27 salespeople to get one to sell your stuff. But then once you've got that one customer, make it really successful. Mm -hmm. Drive it home. And then, you know, I, I will sell my Rolodex contacts and make introductions for you for about 10 grand a piece. So just give me a call <laughs> later on. And I'll get you introduced to all the way up the chain. So. Another business model. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I have a question for you guys, which is, uh, so uh, you've been talking a lot about how Cisco's helping you and has helped you to get to a certain place. Uh, what's the next challenge that each of you have for your own company that you would like more help from Cisco or from other partners out here? So kind of like what's your big vision and what's the next challenge that you have that you hope others could help with? I'll take a first stab at that. So uh, for us, the, it was important to figure out how to move the atomic uh, unit of a server from the operating system up as a starting point. That was the building block, the foundation for what we do. Um, but it's really uninteresting in the context of where things need to go. If we look back 10 years ago, people really cared about what hypervisors they ran on. They, it was really important to them that they were on X or Y or Z. And today, nobody cares what hypervisors they run on. In about five years, people are not going to care about the operating system anymore. They're only focused on applications. So when we talk about movement of workloads, we're talking about movement of applications, and that's where we're headed, which is taking the entire application ecosystem, including all of the network stack that makes up the tiers of application, and creating a NFV translation into cloud architectures. So for us, the next step and the, the next steps up are really the network function virtualization that integrates with the server workloads to create an application stack and moving that entire unit around. Great, and uh, that's obviously one of uh, one of Cisco's directions as well, and it'll be great to do that in partnership yep. or to work on that big problem yep. partnership. So, I, I mean, I think Cisco has already been helping us moving all these build, building blocks forward because it was Cisco who introduced us to Worldwide Technologies. That's one of the world's largest Cisco resellers. So we have a partnership with them. So we're we're putting the right things in place for us to have our software as, as with every SKU that goes out uh, with an IOX capability, have our software on it. So that's what we're driving towards. Uh, and Cisco is openly supportive of that um, and helping us um, navigate the right ways to get there. So uh, we've, we've been, uh, you know, we expect to get there hopefully by the end of this year. So it's, it's been going well for us. Great, fantastic. For, for us, it's, it's just growing and be able to somewhat keep up with Cisco, right? Cisco is a global company, right? We're, we're now 230 employee. Uh, we do have offices overseas, but I mean, we're still a, a, a startup, right? So for instance, like, you know, Cisco wanted to introduce us to the mall in Dubai, right? Which is great, but, you know, it's, it's a little more costly for us as a startup to, to be able to <laughs> to reach out to, to these different locations. So right now, for the challenge for at least Funware is just the growing and the scaling, right? I, I feel like, you know, when it was three people, you know, when I co-founded the company, it's a completely different company, right? In the first three or four years, as we're growing from three to 50 people, right? But in the last couple of years, to go from 50 to now 230, it, it's different. And, and now I, I'm dealing with different issue or different problem that, you know, and then also the, the demand that, you know, partner like Cisco has is something that we also need to kind of grow and balance, and that's some of the challenge that we have. But it's just kind of growing pain that we're now going through. Uh, for me, I would say um, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the tidal wave to happen. Well, not waiting, it's actually starting to hit. So, I mean, so, so until we get beyond the tidal wave, I think I've got enough to do with what Cisco's got us doing right now and the, the benefits from it. But I would say that for that next step, um, one thing I think would be very valuable is if Cisco actually produced a partner mentor program 
where it pairs successful partners with those who are becoming partners oh. to actually create kind of like a an exchange Mentor. because that what we've found is, is the more other partners we talk to and that idea exchange that occurs really is, it helps people shape what they're doing. And you come up with some creative uh, solutions like, you know, we did, uh, we did a, a jo John Chambers actually did a, a demonstration with Google Glass where we were tied into a uh, remote expert and, yep. right, that, and so we got to participate in that. Um, we participated with a robotic wet signature company into it. And some of these solutions, when you get these mixes of ideas together, really allows you to open up and create new ideas that help drive uh, the entire Cisco strategy of moving towards the Internet of Things and working with uh, the omni-channel experiences. Great. All right. Uh, fantastic. Any other questions from the audience? Do you guys have any final words in our last minute here? I would in say the enjoy the ride, right? Because for us, when Cisco invested in us, um, uh, you know, there, there's a co certain cost to that investment from your side, is that uh, we were invited to participate at IoT World Forum. Uh, we're a Vancouver-based company. We went to Barcelona, right? Um, that's an expensive uh, trip for a small company. But we went, and it was value in that. We went to IoT in Chicago, and, and you know, there's one coming up in Dubai. We've been invited to Cisco Live in San Francisco as part of the Investment Pavilion. We were there in Milan. So all those things brings us deeper uh, relationships with Cisco, but it also opens up the door to other companies and other folks that we talk to. You know, um, Funware was in Milan, right, right? So we're in the Investment Pavilion. So even there's a certain amount of camaraderie within that, that small investment community. Yeah. So, Cisco is like a proud parent showing off these, um, these uh, startups that, are, that one day will become very large. So I would say enjoy the ride because Cisco will want to make you successful because as you are successful, they're successful. Right? And so uh, it's been great for us in a the, in the short period of time. Great. Yeah, one, one of the things that you will hear at some point as you're trying to partner with Cisco is somebody from Cisco will sit you down and they will say, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you know, if you want to be Solutions Plus, or if you want to be OEM, or, if, you know, they will say, be careful what you wish for. And they're absolutely right. What they're warning you about is when you do get caught up into that Cisco machine, it is a whirlwind and you have to be prepared for it. Yeah. Great. great. Uh, Susie, David, Shaheen, Kai, Luen, thank you so much. It was a great session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.